regarding suspension policy. Um, some students are shown leniency, while others are made an example of for identical infractions. Um, speaking today uh, regarding the necessary overview of this district policy, especially regarding students ages K through six. Uh, the longer students are suspended from school, the more difficult it becomes for them to successfully transfer back into the regular school day. This leads to more uh, disciplinary infraction, suspension, and ultimate failure. Um, and I think it's time for the district to provide fair and equal suspensions for all students while taking age and level of severity into consideration. Um, it's also time for the district to provide appropriate equivalent instruction while these students are on suspension. Currently at the middle school level, students receive eight hours of time per week um, at J. Watson Village. Parents of suspended students are required to call the main office by 9 a.m. in order to ensure there's a teacher who's available to stay that day. For instance, after-school support for suspended students is not available tomorrow due to the lack of coverage. Hence, suspended students will receive no instruction or support, nor is there any offer for available makeup time. In these frequent instances of cancellation, <coughs> building administration, administration needs to take responsibility and uphold district policy to support and uphold um, students who are suspended, and they need to be held accountable to support those students academically. Um, I just think it's time for the inconsistency to end, um, issue to be rectified, and for adequate and active instruction for, instruction for suspended students um, to be given in order that they are on the path to uh, success instead of failure as they are now. So, is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Anybody else? All right, here we go. I will introduce Mrs. Uh, Hygecker for the district happenings. Good evening. Um, so for this month's district happenings, I was able to visit my alma mater, Chambers Elementary School, uh, where I was tasked with taking a look at a new structure in one of the classrooms, um, where there's multi-age grouping in, in an English new language classroom. This was devised by Dr. Felicello and Principal Petrie over the summer um, when they were setting up the school. <laughs> The ELL population has almost more than doubled in the past five years. You're now at about 17.5%. So what we decided to do was start to think outside the box. So instead of just grouping them by age, saying, okay, well, this student's going to second grade, so they'll be in a typical second grade classroom, we started to really look at the individual levels of our students and how they were performing in both ELA and math. And then we group them based on that in order to provide them as individualized an opportunity as we could. My name is Emily Clossy. I teach kindergarten and first grade combined at Chambers Elementary School. 
The instruction of the classroom is taught in English, but if there's any sort of clarifications that need to be given or any um, more descript instructions, they're given in Spanish to the students that need it. So the fact that we have a bunch of different levels in here is really great. The whole classroom is taught with small groups. Even though some of the students are in kindergarten and some of them are in first grade, we base the groups based on their skill level. So this is a higher level thinking activity. And what they start first is rolling their big dice. What, le what number did you get? Three. Okay. And then they roll their little dice. And what'd you get? And then you have to put together and add together your three plus your one is? Perfect. And then they color in their four. Whereas the group that's over there is my beginner levels and they are just rolling one dice and counting the dots that they get on that dice for their one to one correspondence. It is amazing. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better way to set up the program because of the fact that we both speak Spanish. We can both speak to parents, the children. We can both modify the instructions. Jefferson, mira me por and it's it's wonderful. It's great. I'd like to view it as a ladder, so a student can't climb the the higher steps of the ladder until they have the bottom part there. We love it here at Chambers. Our diversity makes Chambers the real community that it is. summer first. Uh, we had a really busy summer as you can imagine and uh, we, we do work in every school. Uh, we prioritize what we need to do, we make sure we get it done and then things happen along the way that we need to uh, address. Uh, for some reason this year a lot of trees decided that it was time to go horizontal. So we had to cut up a bunch of trees as you'll see through this. Uh, other replacements were electrical, plumbing, plumbing work. Uh, we are still working on our lead remediation and we're putting in bottle filling stations in all our schools. We're about maybe 40% done with that. Uh, the kids love them, teachers love them. Uh, bottles every, bottle fillers everywhere. Uh, pretty much same work throughout. Uh, the family got a new food service line. Uh, we are we bought all the materials for the modular both at Miller and at uh, Bailey, but because of other work that we had to accomplish, we, we got the windows and siding on at uh, Bailey, but did not accomplish it over at Miller, so we'll be doing that next time. Uh, but at Miller, we did get all new stage lighting, and we put LED lighting in the auditorium and in the, uh, in the gym, and so uh, we, we're, we're trying to uh, have a program where we're doing certain areas in every school of high energy use, usually the high sodium lights in gyms and uh, areas like auditoriums use the most energy, so we're, we're systematically going through and changing those to LEDs. Um, there was uh, a need for some extra classrooms in both middle schools, so we built the wall. We had some electrical work to do in those rooms, got those done this summer, and uh, again, just a, a busy summer for the maintenance department. Uh, as far as our staff, I cannot say enough about the custodial staff at the high school. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there's just a lot to be done up there, and it was all done around a major project with 
on average about 100, 100 construction workers on site every day. And they still got us open on time. All the floors were waxed, all the windows were cleaned, all the desks were cleaned, <coughs> all that got done. But uh, we, we did a lot of things just at, as the maintenance department and the custodial staff. Uh, we installed all the, all the soap dispensers, all the toilet paper dispensers. Uh, we, we were up there, uh, Joe Kennedy, our locksmith, all the hardware was installed and all the construction cores come out and all of our cores go in. So it's a completely on our cleaning system right now. And, and that, that was probably about three weeks worth of work for this summer. Every day we're there doing something, helping out the contractors, and uh, obviously we're, we're maintaining a clean and sanitary condition. Uh, at Anna Divine, uh, we cleared all the materials out of the building. We used it for storage for several years. And because it was closed for several years, a few things had uh, uh, deteriorated. Uh, the hot water heater was leaking. We had to put a new hot water heater in. We replaced probably a dozen faucets. There was a bunch of broken windows that were replaced. Uh, we provided a keying system to secure the building because it's still on our alarm system. So we, there, there was quite a bit of work there. We helped with the cleaning, but OCs did most of the cleaning. and. Uh, we're still in process there. We're still working with the BOCES maintenance crew to, to finalize everything. That they're now on our uh, EMS system so they can control their own heat and, and that type of thing. And we're working through that. Uh, just in general, uh, that top number always surprised me. Janet Mean, by herself, one person, three machines, made over two million copies. Uh, the bulk of that is Common Core. So she's actually, she's kind of making textbooks is what she's doing. Most of, most of her work is uh, probably booklets between 20 and 60 pages. Uh, the athletic fields, just uh, from the beginning of spring until the end of summer, there was 138 games on all our fields. We have two guys out there doing all the lining, lawn mowing, putting up fences, you name it, we do it. Uh, small engine repair. 124 pieces of equipment out there, lawn mowers, snow blowers, they're all ready to go. The snow equipment's ready to go. The vehicles, uh, everybody's, everything's up and running well. And uh, we receive, there's a bunch, there's a, all sorts of teacher's orders and uh, supplies that come in over the summer. And we have two guys in, uh, in our <coughs> shipping and receiving, and they handled over 300 orders this year, deliveries to the school, everything was delivered on time. And, uh, some are clean. Again, there's just some numbers up there of things that we have in our school. And, and this is just a snapshot. There's, there's so many other things that, that go on that uh, isn't on the list of here. Um, over the summer, we, through all of that, we uh, also completed uh, 124 work orders, actually a little bit more than that, in, in July. And then in August, there was an uptick. And a lot of the ones in August were uh, moving furniture back and forth between schools, putting, putting, uh, uh, going, making dump runs. A lot of it had to do, we ran three auctions this summer, uh, between the spring and two this summer, and I have another one going out to, to get rid of uh, surplus equipment. So there's just some work involved with that. Uh, the work orders also represent cleaning the boilers and type, those types of things. And this is the crew. Uh, we have a, staff training day where they do right to know and other other required uh, trainings and we have a lunch farm out at Bailey and it said look excited and one group of guys <laughs> 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 so, but, uh, this, this is a, this is our this is the group of uh, mostly clean and staff uh, by school these are the dedicated guys that make those buildings look beautiful every year uh, and I, I, this, I separated the high school guys out. That young gentleman in the middle, Ronnie Rutledge, will be here. His, he started 40 years ago tomorrow. He has 40 years ago. That's why he doesn't have to wear a uniform. That's right. Well, he had to, he, he's, he's kind of like you. He said, I'm cold. <laughs> so, uh, this is the maintenance crew uh, out of the warehouse. Again, dedicated bunch of folks. Really glad. To have them. And and I uh, when I first came here, I, I sat and I thought about what we really needed to do. And one of the first things I did, I, I wrote a mission statement. And it's kind of wordy, and I and I I've been kind of filtering it down. And we and I came out with this focus statement that went out to all the guys today. 
and, and this is what we do. This is what, what we're going to focus on. This is what we do every day to make sure that the kids have a good experience in their schools. And uh, we're going to build off of this. And, and, and our guys are all dedicated to that, to this process. Like the, all of the buildings, all the yeah. time. All the buildings, all the time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I don't know what happened to the print on that. But it's spread out. It looks like a, I'm not the best typer in the world, but I'm better than that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, uh, so uh, this, uh, I have some slides of the Second Century Project. I don't know if anybody has gone by there. This is uh, this is uh, in Salzman. This is the pit for the new elevator on the south end. Those folks are about six foot two each, and they are chopping away at rock. They have to go about another two feet. And probably by the end of this week, they'll be down there. That's the that's the locker rooms at MJM. And uh, today, all of the gym, this whole entire gym wall has been exposed, and the one on the school side. And that started happening this afternoon, and I was there about three o'clock. And everybody in the West Wing was like this out the windows because you could actually see through the building. Uh, and all that's left now, I, probably by now, they, there was a few pieces of steel, and I'm sure they got them to the ground for safety uh, by, by the end of the day. But I, I wasn't there. Uh, this is the uh, cafeteria area. Uh, they're, they're running all the wires and getting things done up uh, in the ceiling there. Uh, mo all the duct work's done, all the plumbing's done. Uh, most of the uh, electric is done, they're just running out whips for lights and everything, that's what these two guys are doing. Uh, this is the other half from the other angle, all the ceiling grid is already up, <coughs> the soffit's done, sheet rock's done in that area, and we're, we're on schedule, we're about a week ahead of schedule on, on, the, uh, on the cafeteria. Uh, this little thing is the vent for the cooking hood, and it has to be uh, certified that all the welds are good and that it holds air. And we are about five or six feet from the roof, and it's all been certified to that point. And so again, probably by probably by Friday, that'll be 100% complete. That is the bridge between MJM and Salton. And we disconnected the building so that we could uh, so that we can tear the rest of it down. They left a little bit of steel on the MJM side just for support of that wall, so we don't have any issues. And uh, they, they closed up this. This was uh, this was Monday of this week. And that's the new gym floor from up on the bleachers. Uh, wow. Still some work going on over at the field house. The, the gym floor is just spectacular. I, I can't tell you how nicely that, that came out. Uh, they're, they're redoing the windows on the outside. They're repointing brick. Uh, this the same thing. Guys on the inside uh, putting new grout between the windows. The, on the Andrew set, street side, all the all the walls have been painted under the brick on the uh, pool area and uh, adjacent walls. The new lockers were installed in the locker rooms at the pool house. <coughs> and that's pretty much it. Speed bumps anymore? Right. So, uh, what we had decided, uh, our civil engineer, Benir and Larios, decided that the speed bumps weren't as effective and they were actually a hazard. And in general, I think speed bumps, and I'm not an expert in civil engineering, but in, in general, they're, they're less effective than signage and paint. And so, we, we took them out, we, we were going to paint some things, and then uh, after the first week of school, we've had some issue with people going through that kind of fast. I, I talked to the SRO. They've issued some warnings to people, and I don't know if, it, they, if the warnings didn't work, they were going to issue some tickets. That, that is our road. Uh, it's not owned by the town. And so uh, we do have control of it. We have signage up. And, and we're trying to determine whether or not we need to put the speed bumps back in. And, and the other thing is, is that the, the other speed bump, the speed bumps we were having were really narrow, so they, they're, when the plow hits them, it knocks them out of the way. So the new speed bumps are like six feet wide, and we're, we're trying to decide how we're going to handle that. Okay, thank you. I think if you see the speed bumps over on Joy's, those are the new oh, type of yeah. speed bumps. Right, those right. are the new speed bumps. Yeah. 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 yeah, especially when you don't know they're there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't know what those little white arrows mean, you know what's coming. There were more arrows for a while.
Thank you, Mr. Clapper. Okay, next on the superintendent's report, we have, uh, although it seems very early, we always start off in you know, October, sometimes early November, with just a very quick budget primer from um, Mr. Olson and Mrs. Woodard. So 
this is a, this is a bit of a look at some of the things that have gone on with respect to school taxes in the last couple of years. Um, this board decided to uh, go forward with the veterans exemption a few years ago, and you can see um, that the number of veterans exemptions actually in this district has fallen over the last two years uh, by 121, which is more than five percent of the total of two years ago. So whether you know, I suppose we can imagine that maybe World War II veterans are, are dying and such, and they're not being replaced by more recent veterans, but I thought that's kind of an interesting interesting to look at. And then the uh, senior citizens tax exemption, which we changed. You want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, the senior citizens exemption historically had been, we had only offered one uh, exemption, which was 50% off the assessment for 65 and older under uh, under uh, income limit of $20,000 and the board decided um, start beginning in 1617 to uh, expand that so we now have a sliding scale like many mun municipalities and other school districts do. So that uh, income level has increased from 20000 up to 267 or around there and they're incrementally um, incremental percentages of assessment that can come off for that. And although these exemptions aren't a really a result in a shift of that tax burden to the rest of the taxpayers, these people are very appreciative. And these people need these exemptions. And they come to the tax window. And they are very appreciative that they've been given this relief. Beth knows these people. <laughs> because Beth. It's at the tax window, as many of you probably know, who come and take your taxes here. Another portion of the school tax relief that we wanted to just briefly touch on was STAR and the property tax relief credit. This has kind of changed over the past five years. There have been different programs. Uh, STAR has changed property tax ca uh, credit, which was uh, a had, had a different name the last three years. Uh, STAR, traditionally we've known STAR since STAR uh, began as a, as a reduction in your tax bill. So those of us who have a basic or enhanced STAR have that amount of money taken off for our primary residence if we qualify off of our tax bill, and our tax bill is $600 or $1,300 less. People who purchased homes or applied for STAR after uh, May of 2015 do not get that benefit on their school tax bill. If they're eligible and they have applied through the State Department of Taxation and Finance, they will get a check from the state directly. So people, when they're preparing their tax bills, you know, one person is getting it, one person isn't. Neighbors could have differences in tax bills that are a thousand or thirteen hundred dollars difference. So it's it's caused a little confusion, and, and with new homeowners who are comparing to former homeowner homeowners, there's been some confusion about that. But the state has made that change. I don't know where it's going. And the other, in the past few years, we've also had, um, if, if the district, school districts maintain tax freeze compliance, if we stay out or below the, ta the tax cap, um, our star eligible taxpayers have benefited from an additional rebate check, um, which initially was the amount of the difference between your tax from the prior year, so there really was no increase in your tax bill. Uh, then it was a crop that plus the prior year plus the municipalities and it's kind of changed the last few years so the new the new property tax relief credit last year i think it was 185 dollars if you were star eligible this year there's a new three-year program and this is a percentage the check that residents eligible residents will receive is a percentage of your basic star and for 17 18 and it's it goes by income so everyone's going to get a different rebate check if, if your income falls below $275,000, you're eligible if you're, uh, if you're star eligible. And this chart kind of shows the income level and what, what your percentage of star you'll get back in the check. Now, every town is different, so uh, we just have to put an average here. So the basic star, the average check would be $37 for the lowest, for the highest, um, income level and then 187 for the lowest income level. And for the enhanced, it's a flat. If, you, if you're eligible for enhanced, you're already meeting an income limit. So it will be 12% uh, this year. And the average from all the towns is 164. Because each town has a different 
star amount, the, that, that check will vary between accounts too. I went on the website for the state the other day and um, it enables you to determine when checks will be mailed and allows you to go in by um, county and then school district and then town. And supposedly in our school district, I checked the city and the town was focused. Checks have been started started being mailed on September 18th. Although we've probably seen, I don't know how many thousands of taxpayers in the last two weeks and no one has mentioned getting one yet, but they should be forthcoming from the state. It's great to have a knowledgeable tax collector. <laughs> and those are going to be increasing over the next two years as well. So we'll see where that comes up. So here's some uh, history. The next two slides actually have some history. Uh, this is simply a history of the budget, and the budget has gone up fairly markedly over over the last uh, six years. You can see this line from probably 142 million or so up to this year's 169 million. These are the revenue sources. The tax levy has gone up at a lower rate, I would say, than the budget itself. And then obviously the revenue, which is mostly state aid, has filled in the gap. So that's one. Chart. Another chart. But I just want to mention that. The reason that we picked these six years is shown on the next chart. Because so these are the six years, this is when the tax cap started. So the yeah. next chart will show that. So these are the six years again of the of the levy limit and our, our actual levy. You can see our levy, the levy that you guys have decided on, is in olive, I would call it, perhaps olive. Uh, and the <laughs> The actual amount that the other uh, teal, that's what we'll call the other thing. <laughs> Great. So you can see that in every year except one, the levy that you guys have decided on has been lower than the actual levy limit, which I think is great. And in one year it was tied, which is uh, that one. Otherwise it's been lower. And, and here's the 1.06 versus the 1.35 in the most recent year. One other thing that I think is important to note here is if you look at the chart, there's no consistency there. So, you know, in 1314, you know, our, our cap was 4%, and this year it was 1.35. So, we don't know what next year will bring yet, but. As you recall, I think Dr. Padalino said it before, you know, there's that. X step calculation that we go through to determine what the what the levy limit will be, and as I said, it's uh, different every year, obviously. So um, we, we wouldn't be talking about the budget without mentioning fund balance uh, issues. There's the four percent, the uh, famous four percent that we try to keep uh, in place. The, uh, the the amount that we've allocated to the budget to the budget as a revenue, which is $2 million this year. And then we have fund balances in various legal reserves. Um, and you can see six that are named there. Those are the reserves that we use. And um, the amounts in them vary. The amounts in them vary because of, of need. The tax <coughs> reserve has an amount that's calculated based on what our what people are asking for out there in the world through, through um, legal means. Um, and then the other ones have various amounts that you're quite well aware of, such as the capital reserve that we voters vote on, and then we are planning on using some of that in the hard, you know. Sure. Um, one of the reasons that we talk about reserves and that we bring, bring reserve funds up at this time in the budgeting process is um, because we will use them in for, for a variety of reasons. One being um, they're targeted, specific reserves are targeted towards specific liabilities. For example, the tax tertiary reserve. We have pending tax tertiary proceedings against the district, and by saving you know, reserve funds that have been left over from prior years, we can hold them aside so that if we have any major settlements or any settlements, we don't have to go back and add that to the budget. Um, we'll have that in savings. We can use that to settle those liabilities. Um, also, they reduce future tax levy increases by 
appropriating towards the budget. So any of those, so unappropriated fund balance at the end of the year can be used to offset the tax, the tax levy for the next year. And even reserves that we aren't going to use can be used in the future. So if we have uh, money left over in a reserve and determine that our liability is no longer at that level, we can use that money and bring it back to the general fund to offset the tax levy or reduce, reduce the tax levy. Uh, we also use reserves used to avoid large tax swings and the um, fiscal stress calculations that the state comptroller's office use like to see that you have reserves, plans for the future, ways to cut your future liabilities. And also another um, important factor to remember is that uh, when the um, the financial people are looking for bond ratings, and when we're going to finance capital projects, they like to see that you have fiscal stability and that you have reserves. And since we will most likely be going out for a very large bond issue in the near future, that's very important that we have that fiscal stability and reserves. And, and the fact that we are in a pretty fiscally stable <coughs> environment here has uh, shown itself through the interest rates that we've been able to get in, in recent years for, uh, for some of the bans that we've issued. So, the, um, the, um, I was just looking at them before we came in. I think either the first or second was less than half a percent. And the most recent borrowing we did for the capital, the Second Century project was 86 or $85 million. Uh, the effective interest rate was 1.12. So they kept us in pretty good stead. Uh, These are two of the reserves, and we just want to discuss a little bit about the uses of them. Uh, we have the balances in these reserves are a little higher. We have the capital reserve fund uh, was approved by voters on 5-19-15. We funded it to the $10 million maximum, and we used that. We're using that capital reserve to fund the Mahar renovation project, so those monies are already available. We don't have to increase the tax levy for that renovation project. Also, we have a balance remaining of $5.7 million in the capital reserve after the Mahar renovation allocation, so that can be used in conjunction with uh, building aid to fund future capital projects to a larger degree. And uh, for those of you who are mathematicians in the audience, you might notice that those two numbers add up to $10 million, $19,000 or so, and that's because there's been interest on those on those monies that uh, we're able to keep in the uh, fund. Also, we recently talked about the tax treasury reserve fund. Uh, we, on a regular basis, every year, we receive just uh, about in July petitions from mostly commercial properties seeking to have their assessment reduced, we keep, we calculate the liability associated with that, and we're able to have a reserve fund to offset that liability should they settle. In the past year and into this year, we anticipate uh, funding settlements of $3.1 million just for two petitioners alone that we know of. So those funds are there for a reason, and we're using them for those reasons. And should there be, uh, most of the, the reserves have specific legal requ requirements attached to them as far as funding them, as far as establishing them, as far as using them, whether voter approval is required or board approval is required, uh, and what you do to disperse those funds once they're, once they're used. In the case of tax tertiary reserve, after four years, those monies have to be returned if they're not used. So. Uh, should the liabilities associated with some of these large petitions be reduced for the future and there's money left over, those monies can be used to be brought back to reduce future tax levels. Um, so okay, the budget development obviously starts here in some, in some fashion. We, um, but in addition, we have to go through these various steps by looking at programs, staffing levels, Transportation, facilities, both these programs, and what's called fixed costs here, which are, of course, salaries, benefits, uh, and that sort of thing. And then we're obviously going to get input from you guys, um, from people out in the schools, from administrators, uh, as we move forward. And then we'll have, as, as we have had before, we'll have public sessions as well, 
to solicit uh, input from the public and to tell them how we're doing in the process as we go along. And uh, we really, we're really, this is kind of early, but really for the budget development process, kind of a continual year-round process, as we notice things or as we people identify things, you know, we're always making notes for the next budget year and things like that. But typically by November, we'll probably have a budget calendar. We'll start the budget template. I've already started that. We're putting in, you know, this year's actual actual amounts and looking at next year's. We'll be looking at, you know, for the next six months. We'll be tweaking that. We'll be adding any known expenses as contractual obligations are known. They'll be added to the budget. We'll be reviewing them and tweaking those numbers. Hopefully by mid January, late January, we'll have some idea of the state's the state's uh, proposal on state aid and better. <laughs> ideas of TRS rates and health insurance costs and things like that. So it's kind of a continual process that's going to go on for the next six months until we get to the you know the April board meeting where we hopefully have a budget that we can adopt. And there are only four slides left. Uh, <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, and again, we used a similar slide last year. This is just showing, you know, for the 169 million where the, the sort of the four main sources of revenue are, and you can see 60% is the levy, almost 37% is state aid, which leaves a mere 3% to everything else. Uh, the major budget components, again, something similar to what we did last year. You can see labor costs are, uh, uh, it won't surprise you that they're 75% of the budget. Labor costs meaning labor uh, salaries and benefits. Um, and then the other categories to the left, the largest being voting services of those, uh, and then debt service, transportation, etc. cetera. Um, of the human resources cost, which is that 75% chunk, this is that. So of the 75%, which is about $127 million by my reckoning, 60% um, of that is salaries. And then you can see the spread of the others through retirement, which is the TRS and DRS systems, Social Security, other benefits, and then health insurance, which is uh, that's full, of course. Um, I, I've said before that we spend one out of every five dollars on health insurance, and that's still the case. In fact, if you take 75% of this, 28%. Uh, it would be 21%, so about 21% of our, of our budget goes just toward health insurance, which is pretty amazing. And finally, I'm going to go through this one. So but, uh, at this early stage, we're just starting to think about the 2018-19 budget and what are some of the things that are going to impact our, where we're going with that. Uh, one is going to be building aid for the Second Century Project as we get closer to submitting that early aid request. We'll get a better feel for that. We're going to be meeting with our financial advisors to develop um, a funding scenario and our debt service um, plan for funding the Second Century project as well as <coughs> any other smaller projects. Uh, we also are concerned about community school set aside. That was a sort of acted as almost a deduction from our increase in um, foundation aid last year. We had to set that money aside. It couldn't be used for anything within the general general fund budget. We don't know what's going to happen with um, the formulas at the state ed still. So we're still waiting to hear about state aid. And we'll hopefully have some better insight into that by later in the budget season. Uh, as always, the tax levy limit, maximum allowable tax levy, are also going to determine how much you know we're going to, to some degree, guide our budget. And for the current year, we just put in some numbers there. For the current year, the, the tax base growth factor um, from last year was only 0.12%. And um, the allowable growth factor, and these are form part of the calculation for determining the maximum allowable tax levy. Uh, the lesser CPI, or 2% prior year, was 1.26%. There have been some hints that the CPI may be a little higher this year. So we'll see where that goes. That's only one factor in the calculation. Uh, capital exclusion, that's a big part of the, 
the calculation. Um, that's your capital tax levy from the prior year. It calculates in as well as your capital tax levy for the current year. And the capital tax levy simply is what you uh, have debt service on for capital projects, less your building aid for those projects. So uh, that would be the capital tax levy that would be part of the budget. Also in the calculation are pilot pilots from prior years and current year we have a couple pilots that went off this year and um, we actually had a new one on we have a new disclosure in our financial statement that our auditors enlightened us about today which um, has you it's just a footnote that has you um, list the calculation of the loss of tax due to pilots and then the amount of pilot money you're receiving so that's kind of an interesting I was just calculating that um, and then uh, also the projected maximum level levy growth, tax levy growth, and that's the tax cap calculation that we're talking about. The final number for the current year was 135, and we actually levied 1.06. Other things that might impact our 1819 budget that are unknown at this time are retirement system rate trends. We've been fortunate in the last couple of years that the retirement system rates have been going down a little bit, and that's helped offset some of our other costs within the budget. Um, labor contracts are also always a consideration, and our debt service planning, as we discussed going forward for kind of the second century and other projects that we might be pursuing in the future. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? At this time? So the, the numbers of the pilot, that actually is pretty interesting. So that will be in the audit. Yeah, it's just like two little numbers at the bottom of like page 56. <laughs> so you have to read page 51 through 55 before you read. I will. Our first budget form will be November 29th, correct? Well, it's of course another one of those things that can fit into the category of tax shifts. The pilot recipient doesn't pay, someone else will. Yeah. Well, I just have the first public, uh, the first um, community suggestion today from a taxpayer who, an elderly gentleman who was a little, felt that he needed to get something for <coughs> his tax dollar and so he didn't want to come to board me, but suggested that we uh, offer some educational classes for <laughs> who are paying for access. <laughs> Thank you, you graphs. Thank you very much. Can the updated graphs be put on the website? This will be on the website. All, All four of the graphs were. They're part of I'm watching yeah. it. I'm just saying it was. It was not the same ones that you showed here. So <coughs> there are people that are looking at it at home, and I was just wondering if these four graphs are on the website. That presentation is on the website. I'm telling you, there's well, we, well, we modified the graphs. Yeah. Yeah. No, so just double check. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's on the board docs. It's on the, yeah, board, it's on the board, board, board docs. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Special thanks to Mrs. Jordan. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Not one talk. Thank you, Mr. Olson and Mrs. Twitter. Um, well, oh, okay. Yes. As you can probably guess from the, our district happening it's been and reporting, and it seems a little early to be the goals also, but uh, we, we, by October 1st, one of the goals to report back to the, to the board um, for myself and my team is the ENL of what we're doing now, what we're planning into the future. Um, the goal on the ENL is that the superintendent will provide the board with a report on the district's current and future plans to address the needs of our fastest growing subgroup, which are English language learners. Just to give you an idea of the growth in our students, uh, in our English language learners, we have the last three years. And you can see, you know, obviously, look, we have more schools than this, but Chambers um, and George Washington have a large population of, of our English or ENL students. And Edson is what we call our magnet school. 
for our EML so we can put all of our resources you know, in one place and much of our, you know, consolidate our resources and serve these students. You can also see we have um, Miller and, um, and Bailey. I'll talk a little bit about this before, but you see here Miller is 0, 0, 17. So I'll, talk about, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. They, um, this was, we were not offering ENL services in Miller prior to this year, but um, Dr. Felicello and her team have really come together to put, put a much more comprehensive program for our ENL students, seeing this, seeing this growth and, and really looking at new and different ideas to make sure we're serving these students. So again, I want to tell you about the, two, the increase I was but the two things you're seeing here. First thing you're seeing is our students who are, who are ENL students. With the star, the stars here coming across, those are our students that are called commanding students. And, and you see up here, I gave a little definition. A student at the commanding level is designated a former ELL student, but they're still entitled to services, for you know, continued services for two years. So while they may not be labeled ELL, they are still entitled to service, so we are still serving them. So again, so just look at Chambers this year. We have one um, you know, commanding student there of our 67. We look back here, there would have been eight uh, commanding students in that number. Clearly, a large increase in the number of students we have, both just in general with our ENL students for the last three years. This is a great slide. I don't expect you to read it all. It is in your packet. <laughs> but uh, what I really like about the slide more than the content is this shows our intent. We now have an actual process for registering our ELL students, and making sure we're identifying our ELL students, what their needs are, and doing it with a couple of things that are, that are new. Um, this 1A, looking at our ELL students who might be IDP and or 504. So we have ELL students who, who are, who we might need an IEP. Here, this, this addresses that situation. Looking at our students with inconsistent or interrupted formal education. From the rest of this point, I'm going to call that site students. So that's just, those are students who come to us who have, have had inconsistent or interrupted education. Um, having a process for registering those students and, and identifying them and when they come to the building. Just having this, having this, this flow chart and people who know their jobs and know what we do when, when our ENL students come in is a big change for us and it's been it's a huge jump forward. Our, new, our English has new language staffing. Okay. We talked about the middles and it's one of the things that, uh, that I think really is going to make a difference for what we're doing with our secondary students is that improvement in Miller or that's offering Miller and I'll tell you why in a second. Our bilingual family workers, that picture is not a stock picture. We, we, that's ours. So we, that didn't kind of come off the internet. So those are our students. That's such a great picture. And proof is that the, the chambers. just chambers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that is such a great picture. It looks like we made it up. Uh, new in 17 18 school year, was, as I've been talking about, ENL programs expanded to Miller Middle School to allow students to remain in their home school. What did we do before? ENL students at the middle school level, we moved them to Bailey. So what happens? Students say, students and parents, students go to their parents and say, I don't want to go to Bailey. I want to stay here in Miller. So they decline services. So now we're not reaching these students because they don't want to move school, move school. So we're able to offer the services at Miller Middle School, make sure we get, you know, get all these students and that they are um, receiving what they need so they can move forward with their education. So this is one teacher, one move, very simple, big results. So we think this is going to make a big difference for us. We have a lot of partnerships around this. You all know this is exploding, and it's not just in Kingston, but it's all over. The, the, the idea of uh, the, the fact that we have a lot of ENL students moving into district districts all over the state, uh, it's exploding. We've been really lucky to have a lot of support from, from uh, community partners. I always want to call this Auburn, but it's not. It's Auburn, uh, which is the Hudson Regional Bilingual Education Resource Network. These people are doing a great job. They come to us. They're free. Um, They've been here spending a lot of time with uh, Dr. Felicell and her team going through. They helped us create that chart that we, I showed you earlier as far as getting our, our students enrolled. Uh, they're doing a lot of training. And, and here's, I won't leave it all to you, but just some specific trainings they've been doing with our teachers um, and our support staff this year. Uh, we actually have them coming in again later on in the month to follow up on a lot of this training. So it's just a, a really good partnership and, and a great help. Hudson Valley Special Education Parent Center. Uh, this is really for, for our adults, obviously. We can try to reach out to the ELL families are as important as the students and making sure that we have that connection with them. Um, 
Ben, ben Cosme. <laughs> Ms. Ben Cosme has been working with us, and she, she'll be in here uh, actually next week, uh, providing training for parents, so English to Spanish, so helping them understand that and getting access to information, and getting them, helping them navigate through the educational process for their students. Um, big help, and, and I think this is great. Again, we want to make sure we have these relationships with parents. Also, let us see, this, is a, this has been going on for a long time, this, this partnership. Uh, again, working with the adults. We've expanded this this year. It used to be just at George Washington. Now we're at Kingston High School and at Chambers Elementary School as well. In the classroom, what are we doing for our, so we're just bringing them in and having some new programs. What are we doing for the new classes? What are we changing what we're doing? This year we've adopted four new, four new curricula to uh, work with our students. Anchor Comprehensive Workshop for our kindergarten through sixth grade inside the USA, fifth grade through twelfth grade. Eggs Fundamentals is a 9th through 12th grade, and then the Do the Math is a 9th through 12th grade uh, math program. So again, you know, we have students that are coming from different cultures, we have students that have the English as a new language, we need to change some of the things we're doing in the classroom, and that's happening this year. I can, I can talk about this, but this is the video. Um, this is what's going on at Chambers. Uh, Dr. Felicel, her team, Kate Petrie, the principal at Chambers, came up with this idea of Chambers. Is, Chambers is not only has right now has our highest number of ENL students, they are our most diverse school as far as ENL students. Most of them are Spanish speaking, but we have we have kind of a, you know, a global imprint over there at Chambers with the number of languages being spoken in those buildings. But this multi age group, just to tell you what it is, even though you saw the video, we have uh, really split kindergarten and first grade ENL and non ENL students all in the same classrooms. The one thing that you didn't see in the video, we have a regular ed teacher, a teacher assistant, and an ENL teacher. So the ENL teacher um, split, split between these two classes. <coughs> the teacher's assistant and the, um, and the teacher stay in these classes. And you heard on this, teachers are TESOL, so we have multi-certified teacher, and then we have bilingual actual teacher's assistants in there, which you saw in the, in the video there. So uh, a lot of support for our, for our ENL students in that area, and we'll, we'll continue to monitor this to see how the progress is. But, I'll tell you, if you go in there, there's a lot going on, and it looks great. In progress, some things we're doing, this, this shouldn't say in progress, really, anyway. this, is, this just happened today. This whole thing is actually the name of the program. It's uh, cultivating different leadership to build systems for English language learner, multi-language learners, success to design new commerce site program and to develop three papers. That's what they call this group. I don't know why. And of course, that comes from SEDA. Um, so, <laughs> no surprise, but we are very happy to, to have been uh, accepted into this program. We're starting in two weeks. We'll be sending a team next week. next week. We'll be sending a team up to Albany to start this training. And again, I think it's a big part of us and move forward in this and, and uh, getting, uh, getting Kingston to be ahead of the game and, and move forward for our kids. Training our staff to utilize multi-language score to identify our site students. That goes back to this slide. This is what we're using here, training them for, so they can use that, that multi-language course so we know who our students are, what they need. Uh, and training to examine differences between language acquisition versus learning disabilities. Many of you here in the time realize we are learning deficits versus a learning disability. This is really, is a language deficit creating us to think, masking itself as a learning disability, or does a student really have a learning disability? That's what this process is going to help us with. We're training in it. We've got it moved. We've got it built into our registration. Um, and, and I think it's going to make a big difference. Other things that are in progress, established protocols for, for our um, LPT and CSE meetings. Again, those are our language proficiency and our and teams and our, and our CSE teams. So we can continue to look at that. Is it, you know, uh, is it a, a deficit or is it a disability? Streamliner registration process, I showed you that. Increased our bilingual and TESOL certified staff. This is one of the things we were really happy this summer when we were interviewing people. How many people came to the table and said, I have my TESOL, or I'm working on my TESOL? Uh, we're working with student New Paul's to offer reimburse, uh, tuition reimbursement on some of the TESOL to, 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 to uh, really encourage our current, student, our current teachers to go out and get that second language certification as well. Um, Chief Information Officer, we're working with Gary Tomczyk to identify a feature for site students into schools along with additional information for L. So we want to be able to identify that for our teachers when they go into eSchool, okay, this is a site student. So that's what we're working on getting that done. Oh, and that's it. Any questions?
Um, well, first of all, I'd like to compliment the team because I remember when you first started thinking about this, it seems like it was last year and you were so far ahead already. So it just is really nice to see the idea come to fruition with the classes in place and it's, it's wonderful. During this, I just, I know it's not exactly the same thing, but it just makes me wonder if we can investigate the um, whether or not it is useful to introduce language to our English-speaking students at an earlier age, because I would love to see that happen as well. Yeah, I mean, and we, and I think we talked about this in our last meeting, talking about the difference between looking at the, an ESL or a bilingual, you know, program. And I think that's our next. That that's really something we're right now. We're looking at our. Uh, you know, making sure we're servicing these students that are coming in. But I think that's a, that's like an advanced program, and I, but I, that's something we're definitely talking about. And, and I do have to um, agree with you. I think Dr. Felicel has, done a, has, has worked uh, tirelessly to put this together and really get into our schools and our buildings, get these programs going, so we're serving our students. So she deserves a lot of the, of the credit for her organization and management of this. And I'm really happy to see that the Miller kids are getting served in their building. Very simple fix, and, and, and you know, it seemed like we made it so difficult for something that we think is going to have huge results. I just think this is, this is impressive. I mean, it's a complicated population, that's, and, and there's changes are happening so quickly, and especially when you're dealing with SIFE students, there's so much to address. And I'm, I just think this is really impressive, and I'm impressed with the way the team has built a way to respond to this and then to continue to grow, because I'm sure this will continue. Not it. So I, I'm really impressed with this, and I appreciate all the efforts. And, and I think one of the things you know, we're not the only ones facing this, and, ha and having partners and going out and seeking out those partnerships to help them. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time, but you know, and have to make sure we're hitting all those um, the areas we need: the parents, the students, the site students, the students who are ELL and maybe IEP or 504. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a, and we're talking about. You know, a fraction of our population, but uh, there's a, l a lot of things they need to get through. I'm just in the same vein. Um, I'm just thinking back, you know, over the years, the the increase in the number of acronyms <laughs> in sight is a, you know, is, is something that I've heard just in the last maybe year or 18 months, and it's just, you know, and we've talked all along about the need for or the goal of differentiated instruction. <laughs> And when all of these new um, acronyms come online that you have to keep track of, the reason is is that because we're implementing differentiated instruction for tailoring our programs for the needs of, of more discrete, uh, granular student populations. I think that's a good word to use, granular. I mean, you're getting down into each of those. Site students have been around. Anyone who's been in, you know, in schooling, we've, had, we've been receiving site students, especially in, you know, in city districts, for a long time. We finally recognized, finally recognized, you know, drilled down that deeply, you know, they, they got to that granular level of where it was, oh, maybe they have different needs than other students, which we knew in the fashion, but I think it's, it's you now it's really becoming more system mm -hmm. Just a little bit on the I'm really heartened to see the number of partners that are available and the outreach that your team has done um, to partner with them because we keep talking about shared services and how important that is in these economic times and also the fact that those partners do exist to help us in that mission. So um, I'm really pleased to see that. And again, I give Dr. Spencer a lot of credit for, for getting out there and finding these partners. I still, when Arbor came in, I didn't know where they were or why they were here. And I think a lot of people don't know about them either, but we were able to access them. And they're free. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to also mention that we use a lot of title funds for some of these some of these positions. They're kind of free funds. We're also using, we, we talked about, uh, Mr. also talked about accessing grants. And we also using grant money, not only for one of our bilingual family workers that the board created last, um, last month that we're, we're actually appointing. Um, today, so we use we use grant funds for that for our community engagement grant, but we're also using it to uh, do some parent outreach with with that uh, that grant fund. So it's we're we're making use of a lot of different 
um, resources. Sorry, before we go on to BOE 39, just to say, um, we have two two new employees who are here with us tonight who are on the on the agenda. Um, one, one. Rachel, <laughs> sorry, one, not two, one, sorry. Uh, Rachel Kaberski. Yes. Yeah. So, well Welcome. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Don't interrupt for that. I know she sat through most of this. Motion to BOE 39. I just wanted to, check, uh, to comment on BOE 39. We're establishing a child safety zone um, on Wilbur Avenue and uh, West O'Reilly um, for uh, student safety purposes. And I want to congratulate the district for moving uh, efficiently in establishing that zone and also thank the, uh, the city. Uh, we have a letter of support which was necessary for establishing the zone from um, uh, was it from uh, Wilbur, Wilbur West Island? Diane uh, first was the safety okay. officer uh, for the city. Um, so it was a it was brought to our attention uh, about six weeks ago that there was a very da potentially dangerous situation with um, safe route to school that wasn't part of the safe route to school program, and uh, so this child safety zone um, establishes um, designates that route as a as a, a safety area and. Uh, allows us to provide transportation to the to uh, impacted student. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you. I just want to thank the um, policy committee for taking on yet another task <laughs> and doing so as Jim said so quickly. Anybody else? All right, all those in favor of the A39, please see the other saying aye. Aye. I just have a couple of questions on it. I didn't pull them. Are you No, not on that. On some other ones? On other? Oh, is that okay to ask them that? Four before. After you make this first motion, but you can say okay. So the, the one I have a question on is how many students to the Langdon School? And why are we using that bus company? 
And are they coming from Kingston? Well, the, yeah, they're coming from Kingston. There's, it's a special education bus. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how many students. I think it might just be. So it's two times a day, then. I believe so. There and back. There and back. Yeah. Okay. Just, I didn't know if they stayed or not. It seemed like a lot. And the other thing was the disposal of the surplus equipment, for instance. I looked over it, and some are in good condition, so what happens to that? It's disposed of. Like rollerblades, I mean, can't you donate this stuff to somebody? Um, we can, after the board declares it surplus, we can then entertain anyone who would like to just have it. Okay. But the board has to, the board has to declare it surplus first. I mean, we try to auction off everything that we could possibly auction off. Okay. So nobody wanted that stuff. <laughs> nobody rolled a blade anymore. Well, that's very 1995. <laughs> well, again, we have the band uniforms. You have to declare the surplus. We do have some people who are interested in possibly the band uniforms. But if you remember, if anybody remembers, those band uniforms are not in good condition. We mean high school band uniforms? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, the they're the old ones before we bought them two years. Yeah. We bought two years ago new ones. They were, and they were like 20 years old. Yeah, they were, they were older oh, yeah. than that. And they were stitched together by parents and by board band boosters for the last for 10 years prior. So then, this has been my um, SOE. It's, I've talked about this several times. It's the special ed annual program and she must manifest manifestation. And we're now getting this from January 4th up until September 26th, mm -hmm. which I've always had a problem with. I mean, we can't vote against it because it should be already happening in programs. But I, I spoke about this several times. So the Committee on Special Ed Recommendations, uh, we're getting committee determined that meetings held on January 4th. There are 110 meetings from January 4th till last week that they're just asking us. And I, it was coming okay for a while, but now it seems like... Well, and also, one of the things that does happen, so that January 4th meeting, you may have approved that January 4th meeting back in February, but then they came forward at the beginning of the school year with a new need, and we had to adjust, we had to adopt that, you know, redo that, that, that And it would phase. still say January 4th. It still say January 4th. Because okay. it would be an amendment. But yes, I mean, and we, it, it comes, it seems like there's, like, a, we, a it's period a of time where we're really going to Thank you. And Dana. Okay, Ms. Goody, would you read the donations, please? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Not prepared. All right. <laughs> we have D10 established a scholarship, whereas it is the desire of Patricia A. Smith to establish a memorial scholarship fund in memory of Ronald and Joan Grant who passed away last year and wished to establish a scholarship fund for an underprivileged student who otherwise would not be able to continue their education after high school. And whereas this scholarship in the amount of $10,000 is to establish the fund and to have an annual award of $500 for a graduating senior, boy or girl, or whatever gender, at Kingston High School who would have a GPA of 75 or greater and who would be attending an accredited college, trade school, or an online educational program. The scholarship recipient shall be chosen by a scholarship committee. Wonderful. And we have D11, uh, accept a donation for E.C. Meyer Elementary School, whereas the Kansas City School District is the recipient of a generous donation from E.C. Meyer PTA in the amount of $740. And they can both our donors. <coughs> okay, thank you. Which brings us to committee reports and uh, the policy committee is the only report we have in the agenda. Yes. Uh, the policy committee met on Friday, September 22nd. We are very busy. It was our first meeting coming out of the summer. And as Mr. Shaughnessy um, already spoke to the resolution, um, just to briefly say that the first order of business at our meeting was we did discuss um, a scorecard because to establish that school safety zone, we had to have a certain number of points. Um, you know, we did some in, consult in consultation with our legal staff and with uh, the safety officer from the city of Kingston. So that was something that was a priority for us and we did establish that safety zone um, for Wilbur Avenue and West O'Reilly Street. And then we reviewed a number of policies that needed updating either for um, 
to be in compliance with the law and for NISBA recommendations. Um, two of them are on here for tonight, which have to do with evaluation of staff, policy 9420 and 9420.1, which Mr. Burge brought to us. Just um, not really substantive changes, just in terms of following uh, legal procedure. We also have, uh, so those will be up for adoption this evening. We also have policy 9215, the non-aligned policy, which we had to update because of four new positions that have been added. And also on the um, agenda are or the uh, policy committee minutes, which were quite brief but quite detailed. Thank you, Mr. Department. So I would like to move uh, policy, can I do them at once? 9215, the non-aligned policy, and 9420, evaluation of staff along with 9420.1 this evening. And our next meeting is this Friday, usually the first Friday of each month, 9.30 uh, here at Sioni. Uh, I sent out the agenda with a few policies to review. Okay. We didn't take a look at Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Moves us to old business. Is there any old business any trustee would like to raise at this time? Okay, hearing nothing, I'll move to new business. Any new business any trustee would like to raise at this time? Mrs. Jordan. Um, it's kind of related to the safe zoning thing. And um, I briefly mentioned this in passing to Dr. Paolino. I wondered if there was any safe routes to school money anywhere available because it seems to me that we have a lot of places where we don't have sufficient shoulders or sidewalks, especially in Hurley or near Crosby School or, you know, they're just neighborhoods that don't have those where the kids still walk. And I just think that if we could get money for signage where during those um, times when kids are approaching school or leaving school, where it could be like a 15 mile per hour speed limit flashing, um, I think that that might be useful. Because when cars go, I, I mean, I'm an adult and I was walking down Santa Road, and when cars come there, it's frightening because they're going the speed limit or more. And I just think if they were approaching me at 15 miles an hour, I wouldn't feel like I had to jump into the ditch. And I just uh, wondered if there's any money available anywhere to help us do that. We spoke about it like at Hurley School on Schoolhouse Lane, where it's so narrow, about the potential of putting in a flashing light there. But I think in, you know, within a mile of these schools where kids are walking, there should be a reduced speed when they're going to school and coming home? We don't, we don't have the authority to reduce the speed limit. <laughs> um, but we do. The municipality. But it, uh, safe, uh, safe, as you, you know, the, right. the city had the safe schools, the, the safe routes to school money that they won. And clearly, Mayor Norman and the team are getting very good at winning um, <laughs> grant awards. And I know they are looking, there was, a, there was another. I, I, we're not eligible. The school district wouldn't be I eligible see. for the state district. It's, it's for cities the and cities towns. And towns. I, know that, I know it's part of the city of Kingston. They are applying for that second round of that money. So that's a, that's a, a positive. I, I do want to, and I do want to commend the city for recognizing the need and, and applying for that and working in conjunction with the school district to, to determine some of those areas. Right. But um, yeah, I think continuing to work you know, as, since the beginning of this conversation, one of the things I'm saying is we have, I mean, this is something we can't do all by ourselves, and we yeah. have to have cooperation from, from uh, the municipalities about what the speed limits are and, and where are certain, where are crosswalks, what they look like, those kind of things. Right. It's a, it's, um, it just know, seems that we always wait for some tragedy first to happen, and we can't control everything, but there are places where these kids are walking and cars are zooming by them, and it is, it's scary. Yeah. Um, there was an article in uh, Executive Pines budget announcement yesterday 
There's an article in the Freedom today about new programs included in this budget. One of them, I think it was about a million dollars for, um, for putting uh, solar powered speed signs in school zones. Um, I think it was that amount of money, but it was, it was a significant amount of money. So I mean, that's something Can we that, write him a letter of support? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we could do that from the advocacy committee. Okay. I don't even recall, unless um, I'm on this meeting, but that at the Meyer School, there's even a school zone sign. No, I don't think that. So is that something that is up to the municipality? I mean, not even a speed limit, to set a speed limit, but to designate something as a school <coughs> zone? Yeah, we don't do that. The, no, the, but to the town, the town or the city. So we have schools in the town of Ulster, and we have schools in the town of Hurley, besides the city of Kingston and about other towns. Yeah, right. so, ten, so ten municipalities really work. You have to get them to petition on that. So I, I do think that that's important. It should be at least designated. Even if we're not going to set a speed limit, that it should be designated as a school zone, especially where Meyer, as you come down, they just put that stop sign a few years ago. You know, and it's right there. Any other um, Mr. Well, this is a comment that I have. I was going to wait for his comments. Board comment that I, you know, about six weeks later, I meant to do it at the first meeting in September. Uh, the week before, about 10 days before uh, Labor Day, there, I noticed uh, throughout the city that the Public Works Department was very busy uh, painting crosswalks, repainting crosswalks, and uh, uh, lane markings uh, on streets throughout the. Still at it. Yeah. Throughout the, uh, throughout the city uh, in anticipation of school uh, starting. And I would just like to thank the city for their efforts in that, re in that regard. That was, that's the first time I've really noticed a dedicated effort over an extended period of days to do that. Any others? Old business? Mm -hmm. Announcements. Mm -hmm. Announcements? Tomorrow, five o'clock, there's a ribbon ceremony at high school. Uh, in the field house, there's a ribbon cutting ceremony. And it's just prior to the parents' day. So, we understand our students all signed up for the people on tours. People that know tours, people, yep, students are signed up. And we have our own official Kingston City School District giant scissors. <laughs> they are maroon. Oh, wow. Get and they say Kingston City School District. Uh, portable baskets are not up to that. Homecoming is Homecoming Friday, right? And Saturday. And the Hall of Fame dinner on Saturday. Hall of Fame dinner. All weekend is filled with Two parades on Friday. I'm coming in meeting Okay, any other announcements? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, oh, oh. There's anyone? Where's the drain bug one? There's anyone who would like to address the board at this time. Please come forward and speak directly into the microphone. For two minutes, and Mr. Kern will let you know. Would anybody like to address the board? I want to um, 
thank you for doing the safe walks to school, but I also would like to um, say that I think there, that it should be expanded, not just Wilbur Avenue. But I um, often give rides to students from Beat Stadium all the way down to Strand, Beat Stadium all the way down to Kennedy School, Beat Strand to Henry Street. And there are lots and lots of places where we have students walking in the dark, walking where there is no um, safe sidewalk. And honestly, we felt that we had a closed campus at high school during the day. And we have students walking at very dark times to and from our schools. So I, want to, I hope you will continue on that committee. And I think it should be brought to um, each PTA of every elementary school and middle school. And it might be good for the district parent group. The other thing is, I really love the idea that we're going to be targeting 400 students of English language learners and their parents to try to get them more actively engaged and involved in these magnet schools. But I do believe that after we have all these wonderful open houses at all our elementary schools, middle schools, and tomorrow our high school, there still is only about 50%, if we're lucky at schools, of parents getting to attend. And I think the other 50% who do not attend, I think the teachers are getting very valuable information in the course of their open houses, not just their course subjects, but also their co-curricular activities. And I believe that that information should be packaged up for every team and group and those parents who are not able to be in attendance, it should be sent home with them during that following week so we can actively engage all parents of all of our students in our district, not just for those who are able to get to our events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Dr. Having I mean, no need of the second executive session, I'll now entertain the motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye.